Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I'm the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. Today is our headache news episode with Dr. Tim Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me on again. Well, thanks for being here. Dr. Smith is a regular on our show due to his extensive experience in migraine and clinical trials as the CEO of Study Metrics Research. Dr. Smith is also a board member of the National Headache Foundation. We are going to discuss some of the recent most interesting studies published related to headache medicine. There has been a lot of talk recently about GLP-1 inhibitors that a pilot study was just published in Headache a few weeks ago on the GLP-1 inhibitor, Victoza, and migraine in patients with obesity. What did they find? So uh, the researchers put patients on a drug called lir liraglutide, which is marketed under the brand name of Saxenda, and it's marketed for the uh, indication of weight loss. It's a once-a-day so injection as opposed to some of the more popular ones, which are weekly. But this is the drug, and, and uh, they studied patients with this as an intervention and then and counted their migraine days, basically, and they showed a, a substantial reduction in migraine days, and it was uh, clinically relevant and very, uh, I wouldn't say surprising, but uh, it, the effectiveness was as good or maybe even better than some of the FDA approved medications that are out there now. And this was a small open, la open label, single, attack, single uh, treatment arm trial. So we don't have the good placebo controlled numbers and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, but better is better. And uh, this is the way we start. You know, we have lots of uh, clinical programs start with a um, open label trial of a small number of subjects. And that's what we have here, uh, but with substantial results. And, the, and one of the interesting things that they showed was that the migraine reduction was not associated with uh, weight loss. So it's not just a weight loss reduction. We know that weight gain is, is uh, one of the key associations with uh, migraine chronification. So it stands to reason that if you lose weight, you have a reduction or less propensity to chronify your migraine attacks. But uh, this drug led to a reduction in migraine days without the corresponding weight loss. So that points to a different mechanism, and we think it may be inflammation-related. Drugs are also shown to uh, reduce expression of CGRP as well, mm -hmm. and I have no idea how that works. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't block receptors that are uh, stimulate receptors, you know, for CGRP. So it uh, just works on these GLP-1 receptors, and that's associated with appetite suppression and increased gastric emptying time so that it makes people feel full and not overeat and mm -hmm. uh, they're less likely to eat snack in between meals. So that's how it works for weight loss, but there's probably another independent effect and it may have something to do with inflammation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring that study up because we had Dr. Bensi Grunch, excuse me, on recently, who's a neurosurgeon and had brought up these medications and how they seem to be helping people with migraine. So it is something that people are looking at and it is so interesting. So yeah. thank you for explaining that to us. Uh, another study we we're going to talk about today, I always like to bring up studies that are helpful for moms who are planning a family, et cetera. So a few weeks ago, a study was published in Headache that evaluated the safety of Ubrojpran or Ubrelvi in lactating mothers. What exactly did they find? Now, we have, to, we have to say here that research and published research is not the same as FDA approval, but it can be promising if we find good news. So what did they find? I'll say it's an open label phase one study. So that means they had lactating women uh, less than six months out from their pregnancy go and stay at a phase one center while they drew their blood for 24 hours. So you can, you know, this is how, you know, take a dose of medicine and then draw every, your blood every hour, every two hours uh, around the clock. So uh, getting people to do those kinds of studies can be a challenge. Uh, but anyway, it gives us much, gives us very valuable information. And I'm going to just cut to the chase and say that this showed very negligible amounts of excre uh, excreted ubrelvi in the uh, breast milk of lactating mothers. In fact, they showed that only two one hundredths of a milligram of, of a 100 milligram dose 
only two one hundredths of a milligram actually made it into the breast milk. So I think we can feel good about that. And and I think they 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 may try uh, submit for you know some label update with the FDA for this, and that would be very convenient to have if we can get it. Uh, mm -hmm. But the results sure are reassuring. And this comes on top of the fact that the rat studies, when they did laboratory animal studies, if you looked at what happens in rats, the serum concentrations and the breast milk concentrations in rats doesn't really change. It's about the same. So this is, uh, you know, obviously we know <laughs> rats and humans are different, and this mm -hmm. is just one more way. And it's uh, reassuring in my book. So we were happy to have that uh, publication to look to. Another study, this was a retrospective study, was published recently in Headache, and this group conducted a chart review of adolescents with migraine who were prescribed a medication called Mamantine. Now, Mamantine is most often used in the setting of Alzheimer's disease, but they wanted to see if this would help with migraine prophylaxis in this group of adolescents. What did they find? Well, they found that it, that it uh, does seem to work. It does reduce uh, migraine days. And these were kids with a lot of headache days. And mm -hmm. the average was 22 migraine days per month. And they shortened that to 15 days. 15 days is still a lot. But if you can take seven migraine days out of the mm -hmm. month, you know, and just in this small subject uh, population, I think that's a very good result. It's better than we see in a lot of FDA approved products. This, this medicine has been looked at in open label series and case series and <clears throat> those kinds of things in the past in adults and did show some uh, fairly successful results in those and some headache clinic specialty clinics will sometimes utilize the drug. It's marketed under the brand name of Namenda, uh, but it's uh, been generic for a while, so it's very cost effective to do. This drug uh, inhibits uh, glutamate. Mm -hmm. uh, receptors. We know that, I don't want to get too esoteric here, but glutamate is one of those excitatory neurotransmitters. It's kind of a brain gas pedal that tends to escalate or be associated with escalation of migraine. And so it makes sense if you can block it, then you can inhibit some of those migraine attacks. And that's what they saw. It's safe to use. Only a couple of the kids uh, in this study developed a little bit of tired feelings from it, which is not bad, you know, for some of the drugs that we use, beta blockers and tricyclics and things like that that are can be very sedating and <clears throat> and sap your energy it's uh, this could have done a lot worse so it's you know hopefully uh, we'll get some good control studies and we'll see uh, see where this goes but it's certainly we're always looking for options and answers uh, some of our listenership and viewership are always uh, interested in knowing more about things that could be a potential help this doesn't guarantee it's going to help anybody but it's good to have options this this medication, I like to talk it about talk about it. I like to bring up that study because I just love anything that can help kids that age, help families with kids that have that much migraine. It's a very difficult situation to be in. So I hope that yeah. that was helpful to somebody. So the next one we're going to discuss is the randomized clinical trial called the Unite study, published in JAMA Neurology. And they looked at a Jovi in patients who had both migraine and comorbid major depressive disorder. What happened when these patients with both migraine and major depressive disorder were treated with a Jovi? Well, uh, they got better and they got better on both accounts. Their yeah. migraine days were reduced. Not a big surprise. That's what we use a Jovi for. Right. Um, and maybe it's not a huge surprise that if people have less migraine, they'll have better moods. Right. Uh, but they, uh, the patients were assessed using this Hamilton depression score. We call it HAMD uh, scale in, in the clinical trials. And they showed a substantial and clinically significant uh, reduction in their depression scores. Interestingly, and I think one of the really cool things to point out about this study is they, they actually, everybody that was in the study had had the qualifying migraine diagnosis, and they also had a qualifying major depression diagnosis as well. This is unique because sometimes we wind up with patients with depression in clinical trials, but for the most part, most of the sponsored clinical trials, they exclude those patients just for safety risks and those kinds of things. So here we have a great study that, that actually uh, proactively recruited patients with both diagnoses, with significant, they had to have at least a year of de of a depression episode that they were struggling with. So these were not people who had a history of depression, were on medicine, and they were fine. We mm -hmm. see a lot of people like that, 
but these were people who uh, were still having struggles with their depressed moods despite um, being diagnosed and you know plugged into the healthcare system and and being treated and um, that was great and to our knowledge this is the first study that has actually gone out and intentionally prospectively done a, a clinical trial most of the work that we've done seen done before is observational studies or cohort studies where you know patients just happen to fall into a a database where we can look at outcomes. And those are helpful too, but nothing satisfies the scientific standards better than a prospective uh, controlled study. So kudos to the to the uh, researchers, as Richard Lipton and, and some of his collaborators. <laughs> We've seen them so many times in the literature with good studies. So we, we know that we usually give them the stamp of approval because they do a good job <laughs> of designing these things. So right. Uh, Tip of the hat to them. Right. And it was a very interesting study. I like that one. Um, The next one we're going to talk about was a group uh, in the UK in the Journal of Headache and Pain. And they looked at the efficacy of Amavig on people with NDPH or new daily persistent headache. And I always like to report these types of studies because there's just not as many people studying NDPH as there is migraine, et cetera. And we know we have a lot of friends in our audience that have NDPH. So how effective was Amavig in treating NDPH? Well, so this was a, a sort of interesting study. They they uh, designed the study to have three comparison groups. And what they did is, you know, we know that chronic migraine, especially daily chronic migraine, can appear to be very similar to new daily persistent headache. The primary distinguishing feature is that the NDPH, new daily persistent headache, is just like that. It starts suddenly. And most of our chronic migraine people start with intermittent episodic migraine and will evolve into or or transform into a chronic migraine condition. And some of the more severely impacted of those folks will progress on to a a daily chronic migraine. So there's a little difference between the daily, every single unremitting day and chronic migraine. And so what they did in the studies, they recruited a, a, a population of NDPH patients they had daily chronic migraine patients, which are phenotypically ident- identical, but they have a different start, you know, uh, to their syndrome. And then the third was patients with chronic migraine, but not daily chronic migraine. Uh, so they treated them all with uh, with the Jovi and standard doses. They did the two twenty five per month, and they looked at them at their monthly migraine days and headache days at the end of twelve weeks, which is kind of the standard first endpoint that we look at in clinical trials. And uh, basically, they showed that uh, the Ajovi worked for the chronic migraine populations. It worked better for the non-daily chronic migraine populations. Something like 80% of those patients had a reduction. I'll I'll quibble with them a little bit on their endpoints. So what they did is they they said uh, they were looking at the proportion of patients that had a 30% reduction in their Mm -hmm. migraine days. We usually in migraine or headache days, I should call it, not migraine, but we usually look at 50% as the as the sort of the measure of improvement that we're trying to get. That's what the pivotal trials have looked at in all the studies. Mm-hmm. This they kind of lowered the bar a little bit because NDPH is so hard to treat. Yeah. And what they showed was that the chronic migraine population that's not daily, I think the result was something like 86% uh, mm-hmm. of the population achieved that 30% reduction in in their monthly migraine days or headache days. And then the NDPH group, it was only 23%. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, less than one in four got this kind of lower bar, you know, that they that they managed to achieve. So it's, on one hand, it's sort of discouraging that, you know, it, it, it looks like we can't count on the CGRP blockers very yeah. well for NDPH. But on the other hand, you know, there is one out of four that... Uh, kind of did have an improvement. And a lot of our NDPH folks out there would love to have a 30% reduction in their monthly headache days. So right. yeah, I don't want to, I wouldn't blow it off, but it does does point out that there's something fundamentally different about NDPH uh, from chronic migraine. And uh, the CGR, CGRP may be part of that scenario, but certainly blockade of CGRP with one of the best drugs we have mm-hmm. doesn't get the job done. And right. uh, for for the majority of people, so it's helpful that to know that uh, there's a handful of folks that would benefit. And I would say in the clinic, 
I would certainly give it a try. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. worth trying. I wouldn't let this study or others like this kind of dissuade you from doing it because there are some that will respond at least partially. So it's worth right. a try. But from, from a scientific standpoint, it, it means we've still got a long way to go on this, unfortunately. Right. I think it's helpful for people with NDPH or people who know them just to hear these types of things that just so they know they're not the only one who the medications are not helping them. And, and we do have a long way to go, as you said. So I always like to bring up those studies. Last, we have sort of a fun, interesting study that I like. It's a study that was just published. It literally just came across my desk about the cycle of the moon and uh, migraine attacks. This, this really is kind of fun. Can you tell us what this is about? And I also found this interesting because I have a friend who's an OB who swears that more babies are born on a full moon. So, so I keep hearing from doctors that the moon matters. So tell us what this study found about migraine in the moon. Well, it, from the results of this study, it looks like the moon matters with migraine too, but it <laughs> not, doesn't track with the full moon. Interestingly, it tracks yeah. with the new moon. The so new it's moon. like the, the last day before and the first day of the new moon seems to be like the worst uh, period of the month for migraine attacks. And it was about 35% more uh, migraine liability at that end point, that time point in the lunar cycle as compared to the full moon cycle. So, you know, I don't know if, if that has anything to do with having babies <laughs> and uh, maybe if uh, people feel better on a full moon and have their worst migraines on a new moon that, you know, like <laughs> nine months later, there's going to be more babies born or something. <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, I shouldn't have gone there. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Um, but uh, this was actually a, a quite what from a methodology standpoint, I think this was a great study. They they tracked this population of patients just prospectively, and they captured all kinds of variables. And patients did like diary entries twice a day in terms of their health and their headaches and what they were doing. They tracked their menstrual cycles. A lot of people will look at it and say, "Well, every, you know, you have menstrual cycles. Maybe this population it was it was their menstrual cycles just happened to jive together." And it did not. And so mm -hmm. this was had nothing to do with their menstrual patterns. It did, had nothing to do sleep. Uh, with uh, any other yeah. uh, activities that they were tracking. They had these patients wear active, active, actigraphy monitors, you know, like the uh, uh, Fitbits and things like that. So they could track, you know, some, some of their vital signs and their, how, how active they were, how, how much they were sleeping, how physically active they were. And there was no corresponding association with any of those endpoints, but there was for the lunar cycle. Um, very interesting. And we, you know, this circumlunar cycle is recognized in uh, many animals and insects and other, you know, species of living beings on the planet. And uh, some of those are known to be uh, genetically uh, driven that there's a, there are genes that express, you know, lead to the expression of proteins or other molecules that uh, tend to be associated or expressed or have their effect with respect to the lunar cycle. So it just makes you wonder if there's some kind of uh, primordial, you know, thing that lives in the migraine brain that is something in your, your lizard brain, some of my patients call, you know, you're, uh -huh. you're made some evolutionary thing that's just stuck with us uh, over the millennia that may be associated with uh, expression of some inflammatory proteins or something else or has some effect on, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, neurogenic or, or neuronal pores that allow chemicals to flux in the brain and, and be associated with migraine physiology. Right. It's, it's a, a bit of a leap between what we know and, and what we can hypothesize, but huh. it's fun to think about it. And I thought that was a fun little article. And it's well yeah. done. And, uh, you know, I think it'll open up the doors to a lot of thinking about this. And, and I guess from a practical standpoint, our patients would, you know, if you find that uh, there's something to this and everyone will have to do their own litmus test on it to see if it applies to them personally, but you might want to make sure you got your abortive medicine refilled before, right. the, you know, have it handy. You don't want to get caught in a, in a new moon with uh, <laughs> that abortive therapy handy. So anyway, I don't know. Very, very there. good point. Good, good, good advice. Uh, so yeah, so thank you for that. And uh, glad we got a fun study. and We can end with laughter. So thank you for being here, Dr. Smith. And thank you oh, everyone pleasure. for joining us on this episode of Headwise. Please join us again. See you soon. Bye-bye.